Okay, this is part two of today's magnetism lecture. Let me take you through a couple of lecture examples. So at this point, go ahead and copy down the first of those examples into your notes. This first example here gives you an idea as to exactly what is meant by one Tesla and how we can measure it. Okay, so this describes an experimental method of measuring B. That's once again the magnetic field. Okay, a wire with a mass of 0.05 kilograms and a length of one meter is vertically suspended by a pair of conducting flexible leads while in the presence of a uniform magnetic field that is horizontal and perpendicular to the board. So the situation looks like this. Okay, right here is the wire itself like so, and then basically we have the opposite ends of the wire hanging from two conducting springs. These are sometimes referred to as leads. So there's a spring here, and there's a spring here. Okay, and then up here we'll say is a battery, like so, such that a conventional current I flows in this direction on the diagram. Okay, the length of the wire itself is referred to as L. Okay, so the mass of the wire is given to us as 0.05 kilograms, and the length of the wire L, that's given to us as one meter. Okay, let's say that the current, however, is not flowing yet. Okay, so if there's no current, this then means that we have the following forces that are going to be exerted here upon this hanging piece of wire. We, of course, first of all, have its own weight straight down. So let's say right here is the length of the wire, and then right here is its center of mass. So right here is the weight, mg. And then you basically have a spring force, a tension, if you will, on either side here of the wire. So there's a tension in this direction, there's a tension in this direction, and then all the forces cancel out because the wire is just sitting there. So the two tensions cancel out with mg. Okay, and now let's say that we turn on the current. So the current I is flowing, and the value of the current is given for us as well. I forget what it is, let me look at it. Okay, the value of the current is given to us as 0.5 amps. So, so that's not a lot of current. However, we do have a magnetic field that is present as well, and that magnetic field is uniform, so it means it's constant and it's everywhere in space, and it points into the board. So then therefore, if we now use the expression F equals IL cross B, or IL times B as we're referring to it here in class, okay, here is then therefore the direction of the force vector exerted upon this current carrying wire, in the presence of the magnetic field. We use right hand rule. So you point the fingers in your right hand in the direction of I, curl your fingers in the direction of the B field, and then the force vector is exerted upwards. That force vector, vector that's exerted upwards causes these springs here to go slack. And then therefore, there are no longer these two tension forces present. You only have a magnetic force upwards that is canceling out with the weight downwards. So then therefore, our diagram changes. Okay, so now with the current on, once again, here's the wire. Okay, here's the weight from before, mg. And then because the magnetic force is applied at all points along the wire equally, it then mathematically behaves as if it's only applied at the center of mass. So like so, right here at the center of mass, is the force ILB upwards. And then the two forces just cancel out because once again, the wire is just sitting there. So you basically have the wire initially hanging on the springs. You then turn on the current. There's a force upwards exerted upon it due to the magnetic field, which removes the tension from the springs. And then the forces here and here just cancel each other out. So ILB is equal to MG. And now we just solve for B. Once again, this is a very easy means of actually measuring the magnetic field's magnitude. So Mg over Il once we do the division. All right, so mathematically then we end up with the following. So 0.05 times 9.8 in the numerator and then divide by I times L. So 0.5 amps multiplied by one meter for the length. And this then ends up being 0.98 Tesla. So it's about one Tesla, like so. And that would then be the strength of the magnetic field, okay? Okay, that's the first of the, the lecture examples. Let's take a look at the next one. In this case, we're gonna take a look at the force that's exerted upon a moving electrical charge. We'll take a look and see what happens first of all in a proton, and then secondly, an electron.
Okay, let me go ahead and move my file to that point. Okay, I'm going to do this problem here and also the one that follows just in terms of the mathematical symbols. I'm not going to worry about any numbers or anything like that in this, these examples. Let me just give you a basic understanding as to what happens in these two cases that we'll look at. Okay, so the first case involves a proton and then secondly an electron with a velocity v introduced into a region with a constant magnetic field that is perpendicular to the velocity. Describe the subsequent motion. Okay, so let's take a look at the proton first. Okay, the proton will have a mass we'll refer to as m sub p, and it has an electrical charge here of E plus. Now remember that the plus sign means that the proton is positively charged. Okay, let's add the proton here. E plus is moving in this direction like so with velocity v, and then we have the magnetic field that is once again into the page like so. Okay, the magnitude of the force vector is gonna be qv times b, and then we have the direction of the force vector in the following way from right hand rule. So you point your fingers in your right hand in the direction of V, curl your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, and then the force vector points upwards on the diagram like so. The magnitude of the force is this. But that force vector is always perpendicular to the velocity vector. So then therefore what happens a moment later? Well, because the force vector is perpendicular to the velocity vector, the magnitude of the velocity vector is not going to change. In other words, the speed of the proton is going to be constant. However, the direction of the velocity vector changes. So then therefore, a moment later after this diagram, because this force is exerted perpendicular to the velocity vector, a moment later the diagram looks like this. So right here is the velocity vector like so. Right here is the magnetic field once again into the board. And now go ahead and use right hand rule. We have QV in this direction like so. We then curl our fingers in the direction of the B field like so. And then I have my force vector like so that is still perpendicular to the velocity vector from earlier. Think back to the first semester. What type of motion occurs where you have a constant speed and the force vector is perpendicular to that velocity vector. That's going to be uniform circular motion. So in the presence of this magnetic field, then our proton basically circulates on the diagram in the following way. Like so, it circulates counterclockwise on a diagram where basically what we looked at on the top board was what was happening here initially when the velocity vector looked like this. Once again, the B field here is into the board. Okay, now think back to the first semester when we write F equals MA for situations involving centripetal force. Or on the right hand side of the expression, A sub C, if you remember, is the centripetal acceleration. The left-hand side of the expression is QV times B from the top board. The centripetal acceleration is equal to the speed squared divided by the radius of the circle. Usually what we're interested in calculating in such a situation is the period associated with the proton's motion. The period associated with the proton's motion can be found from the following expression, which we also saw during the first semester. Remember when talking about uniform circular motion, speed as distance divided by time is equal to the circumference of the circle divided by the period, the time necessary for one revolution to occur. Let's go ahead and take this expression here and do a little bit of cancellation. I'm gonna cancel out one of the V's like so. And then let's go ahead and substitute this expression here for V and for the following. This right here, by the way, is the mass of the proton. Let me go ahead and indicate that here like so. It's m sub p once again, and then divided by the radius, and now multiplied by the speed, 2 pi r, divided by the period. And then we can go ahead and cancel out an r 
on itself. So the period of the motion then associated with the proton, if we go ahead and do some cross multiplying, is two pi times the mass of the proton, and then divided by its electrical charge, E positive, you remember, and then multiply by the magnetic field. So once again, the proton here traces out uniform circular motion on the diagram. Okay, what will change about the electron? What will change about the electron is as follows. Okay, let me do some erasing. Okay, so there are two main differences about the electron as opposed to the proton. First of all is its mass. Okay, the mass of the electron, I'll just write it as m sub b, is about one ten thousandth the mass of the proton. But also keep in mind that the electron is negatively charged. We'll write that as an E minus like so. Okay, so then which direction is the force, going to, the force vector going to be here in my initial diagram if we're talking about an electron? Well, once again, we take the fingers in our right hand and point them in the direction of V. We then curl our fingers in the direction of the B field, and that then gives us the force vector upwards once again. But the electron is negatively charged. The negative sign of the charge reverses the direction of your thumb. So then therefore, for that reason, the force vector points downwards on the diagram like so. Uniform circular motion is still going to result for the electron, however, but in this case, the circulation will be clockwise on the diagram. It will look like this. So here's a clockwise circulation where basically what we did for the electron is we looked at the force vector that was exerted upon it like so, right here at the top of my simple diagram. The period of its motion is once again going to be governed by this expression here. That's why I left it there from earlier with respect to the proton, but there are two differences. First of all, this right here is the mass of the electron, and this right here is the charge of the electron. So and therefore the period is written in the following way. Like so. Keep in mind, however, that the charge of the electron and the charge of the proton is the exact same number. So then therefore the period of the motion is ultimately going to be governed by the different mass of the electron as opposed to that of the mass of the proton, okay? Okay, and then lastly, go ahead and copy down the third of today's lecture examples. Once again, we'll just take a look at it qualitatively and then I'll give you a nice application of it as well. Okay, let me go ahead and erase the board here. Okay, so here's the diagram associated with this third problem. Okay, right here is three-dimensional space, like so. Right here is the Z direction, and that's the direction of the magnetic field line. So the magnetic field line points upwards on the board, like so. Okay, we're specifically talking about an electron here, which is negatively charged. Okay, right here is the electron along the x-axis, which is pointing straight at us at this moment, and then its velocity vector at this moment looks like this. Like so. And that velocity vector has components. It has a component right here in the xy plane. Let's refer to this as v sub y. And it has a component here in the z direction as well, pointing upwards on the diagram. Let's refer to this here as v sub z. Okay, now let's go ahead and use right hand rule here to get the direction of the force vector. In order to do so, what we do first of all is we take the fingers in our right hand and we point them in the direction of the velocity vector v. That's like this. And then we curl the direction of our fingers in our right hand in the direction of the b field, which points up on the diagram like so. Notice the direction of the force vector is out of the board. It's along the positive x-axis. But we have an electron, which is negatively charged. That then reverses the direction of the force vector. So the force vector, therefore, on this diagram, points along the x-axis in the negative direction, like so. 
The magnitude of that force vector is going to be the following. It's going to be the charge of the electron multiplied by the y component of its velocity multiplied by the magnetic field. What you then end up with here in the xy plane is uniform circular motion, just like we saw in the previous example. And there is a period associated with that motion calculated out exactly like we would have done in the last example. But there's also a z component here to the velocity associated with this electron on this diagram. What happens with that z component? Well, this z component of the velocity is completely unaffected by this force vector, which just points here along the negative x direction. So the v sub z is a constant. So can you picture the motion that then results? You end up with a combination of two things. First of all, a velocity in the z direction, which doesn't change, and then uniform circular motion in the xy plane. Combine the two together. You then end up with the following motion. Okay, so once again, my three-dimensional space from the diagram above looks like so. We're right here is the direction of the V field. And then we have uniform circular motion in the XY plane and constant motion in the Z direction. This then results in the following. The electron spirals like so along the magnetic field line, pointing in this direction on the diagram. This distance right here is referred to as the pitch. That distance is equal to speed times time, but it's specifically the speed in the z direction multiplied by the time between here and here on the diagram. Notice that that is one period when talking about the uniform circular motion. So the electron, the charged particle, it spirals along the magnetic field line. I show this very nicely in a screencast video for you in today's folder. Make sure that you take a look at that screencast video. I've also posted for you in the folder the link that I used in that screencast. So take a look at that now, please, if you haven't already done so. Okay, let me go ahead and finish here by giving you a nice application associated here with this spiraling electrical charge along a magnetic field line. Okay, specifically this will have to do with the Earth and how it interacts with what is called the solar wind. The solar wind is basically a stream of charged particles, positive and negative, that is coming off of the sun. So let's say that right here is the Earth. Here's the equator, here's the North Pole and the South Pole, and then over here is the sun. And then coming off of the sun is what is called the solar wind. Once again, it's a stream of charged particles. Okay, and then the Earth, as I described before, has a dipole magnetic field shape associated with it. However, when it interacts with the solar wind, the net magnetic field that you end up with then kind of flares out like so in the direction opposite of the sun. This is referred to as a magnetic tail, and basically the overall magnetic field then roughly looks something like this. So I'm kind of drawing it a little bit bigger, like so on the right-hand side of my diagram. It kind of flares out a little bit like so as the magnetic field interacts with the solar wind. Okay, and then basically the expression that governs what happens here is once again QV times B. 
most of the solar wind is deflected by the Earth's magnetic field away from the Earth. So most of the solar wind basically does this. Like so it gets deflected away from the Earth by the Earth's magnetic field. This is a good thing. The reason why this is good is because if the Earth's magnetic field wasn't there, then the Earth's atmosphere would be at the mercy of the solar wind. And imagine all those charged particles slamming into the Earth's atmosphere. Eventually, due to friction essentially, eventually the solar wind would ablate away the Earth's atmosphere. This is actually what happened to Mars. Mars is sometimes nicknamed the Earth gone bad. The reason why is that because ultimately with the planet Mars, it was too small overall to maintain a large magnetic field over billions of years of cosmic history. So basically after Mars's magnetic field shut down, the reasons why it did is rather complicated by the way, then basically the Martian atmosphere was at the mercy of the solar wind. And over the last couple of billion years, basically the solar wind has stripped away the Martian atmosphere. So this is the reason why today Mars is essentially an extremely cold, desiccated desert. At any rate, however, the Earth being larger has been able to maintain a magnetic field over billions of years, and that magnetic field has protected us from the mercy, if you will, of the solar wind. However, sometimes some of the solar wind particles do interact with the magnetic field of the Earth, and they then do the following. They spiral along the magnetic field lines like so, and they are directed towards the poles. There, the charged particles do slam into the Earth's atmosphere. They do this both in the north, and they do it in the south as well, like so. When those charged particles hit the Earth's atmosphere at an altitude of about 60 miles or so above the surface of the Earth, energy is lost as light. This is the cause of what is called the Aurora Borealis. The lights associated with the Aurora Borealis, well, that ultimately comes from the fact that the solar wind's charged particles are being directed by the Earth's magnetic field towards the very far north and also the very far south. And then when those charged particles slam into the Earth's atmosphere, some of the energy is released as light. The same thing, by the way, happens in the Southern Hemisphere as well. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's referred to as the Aurora Australis. But it's essentially the exact same effect. What happens when the charged particles of the solar wind interact with the Earth's, magne or the Earth's magnetic field and then its atmosphere in this manner. I've posted for you a very nice time-lapse Aurora video as well in today's folder. I invite you to take a look at that. If you look on YouTube, you can find all sorts of spectacular videos of the Aurora Borealis and the Aurora Australis. I have seen it for myself. Okay, that then concludes today's lectures here on magnetism. That concludes part two. Okay, today's shirt was Gorgon's. Stay safe, everybody. Flatten the curve.